Welcome to CMO Confidential, the podcast that takes you inside the drama, decisions, and choices that go with being the head of marketing. Hosted by five-time CMO, Mike Linton. Welcome, marketers, advertisers, and those who love them, the Chief Marketing Officer Confidential. CMO Confidential is a program that goes inside the drama, the decisions and the politics that go with being the head of marketing at any company is in what is one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite. I'm Mike Linton, the former chief marketing officer of Best Buy, eBay, Farmers Insurance, and Ancestry.com, here today with my guest, David Kenny. Today's topic, an experienced CEO talks about marketing, measurement, and the future. David started his career at Bain and went on to be the CEO of Digitas, the weather company, and now Nielsen. He's also served on uh, probably too many boards to count. Full disclosure, I worked with David's agency during my time at Best Buy and found him to be strategic, client-focused, and hilarious, so I hope he lets the hilarious part out today. He's seen the industry from every angle, which gives him a unique, in my mind, 360-degree view of marketing and CMOs, and it's great to have him on the show. Welcome, David. Glad to be here, Mike. I, I hope you didn't overpromise for me. Oh, I am certain I did not. So, uh, first question, David, you've been in the seat, top seat for years. Tell us what you see now from a business perspective. What are the biggest issues on the horizon? Um, listen, I, I, I think CEOs, those who are going to succeed, are spending a lot of time on their talent. Do you do you have people? with the skills to succeed as technology evolves, as the consumer evolves. We're now facing a, a, a new growth of artificial intelligence. All of those trends put real stress on talent. And we also are in a world where the population isn't growing. And so the, the ability to get new talent is, is even more scarce. And so those who are really focusing on skills and organizational structure and development, particularly in a hybrid world, I think are those who are preparing for the future best. Hey, hey David, can we talk about talent a second before we flip this over to marketing? Because the, the other thing I will say, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, is a lot of the talent is not being trained like it used to be trained because there isn't the money or the time to train the talent. Is that a, is that a fair comment or not? I think, what. Well, I hope that's not true at Nielsen. It's a, it's an investment I protect. I think that is generally true. Um, when when I look at the clients I work with today, um, I do find that people are not being developed um, as as they used to be. When the need for development is actually orders of magnitude more than it was a decade ago, be, because of all the trends I described before. So I I do think there is a divergence between development training mentoring uh, and the skills required. Um, and I think we all learn to use technology to work remotely part of the time. Um, most businesses are hybrid now. Um, and that's actually, I, there's a lot of good in that, but that's creating a real burden because people don't know how to develop in a hybrid format the way they need to. Yeah, so I, we'll move on, but I agree. I, I also think not being in the office at least some of the time deprives you of tons of training through serendipity and just casual, uh, you know, connections to other functions. So, Absolutely. So, uh, so well, let's write the marketer into that story, since you know many of our listeners are marketers or, or ad agencies. What should they be doing now to prepare for that kind of future, both in in the marketing function, also you know, as an agency? Well, I uh, I always say. If you've got a problem on a plane, put your own oxygen mask on first before helping others. So you know, <laughs> I would uh, I would say here it's really important that that CMOs acknowledge what they don't know. I think making time to read, to learn, to network, um, to try new things, I think is is really important uh, because you're not going to be able to develop your team and your colleagues if you're not developing yourself. And, and I think the same with agencies, you've got to be curious and make sure you've got enough time to be looking at what's out there. So that's, uh, you know, that's an obvious uh, 
first step. In terms of, of what to learn, I, I do think, uh, and as you know, I spent a lot of time in machine learning and AI. Yeah. I do think it, it is accelerating. Uh, it creates a lot of opportunity to be more effective. It creates risk as well. So understanding that is key. We have more data than we ever had about the consumer. Uh, she's sharing a lot more with us. Making sure you know how to use that data and not abuse it, I think, is uh, is key. Um, and it's a team sport. So as, as you're a marketer, increasingly marketing, supply chain, <laughs> sales, product development, finance, IT, these things all have to work together. So the more you're looking sideways at the rest of the functions you need to interact with, I think the, the better you're going to be, the more effective you're going to be, the more valuable you're going to be to your consumer or your customer and, and also to your company. So this goes back to our discussion about remote work actually may potentially slowing down some of that understanding of other functions. And I, I love the, the discussion about you you need to learn and acknowledge the stuff you don't know. But in addition, in addition to listening to this show, what other recommendations, do you have any specific recommendations of how people should go learn this stuff? Because there's so many possibilities to learn. Um, so there's a, there's a number of good blogs out there from, from all the cloud companies, from, from Microsoft, from Amazon, from Google, around AI and, and what they're seeing. And I, I subscribe to all of them. I think it's it's important to to learn and understand what the applications are there. Um, I also think it would be important to go to it, marketers like to go to CAN, they like to go to CES, but I uh, I actually <laughs> I have never gone to CAN, but I have gone to CES a lot. But yes, <laughs> well, it's it's amazing how many people are going to fly to France in two weeks to meet with each other when they have offices up and down Madison Avenue. But I guess I guess it's better with Rosé. However, um, I would say uh, it's valuable to spend more time on on other topics. Like the more marketers that go to uh, conferences around diversity, I think, really learn a lot about how to build a talent base. Those who go to conferences around data, data science, understand the basics. I think are just getting stronger. And so, you know, again, it's not just it's not just reading, it's also pushing yourself into adjacent areas. And and conferences are a great way to do that. They get you back together, they get you to see people. But but sign up for things that are uh, adjacent to your space as opposed to staying in your lane. And I think you become a more rounded um, and more effective CMO or okay. or agency leader. I like that widening instead of deepening. I think is 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 is, is how I, I've kind of looked at it. So so he, here we are. It's Nielsen. So I have to talk about measurement. Let's talk about what's happening on the measurement front. You know, we've seen measurement explode in the last couple of years. Tell us top line. What what should our listeners be thinking about measurement? Well, and and some things haven't changed at all. So. You know, obviously, what what we measure is is audience behavior, how they engage with media. The the first, a, a lot of your listeners will know Nielsen ratings from the way they use them for for buying ad space, but the first use of Nielsen is actually programming and deciding what to produce, and uh, that's really changed. The the media companies used to build an audience in a pretty straightforward way. They they. Had, 24 hours, you programmed about 18, um, and uh, you, you had to figure out what show to put in every hour. And you would invest to fill the nine o'clock hour, the 10 o'clock hour, that'd be your prime time slate. You'd buy sports rights, you'd invest in some news coverage, and everything worked on a schedule. Now, where the majority of American households don't have pay TV, and, and pay TV continues to, to get canceled in favor of streaming apps, uh, that that takes the whole notion of time-based media and, and moves it away. And I think that's especially true in entertainment. And so now you actually need to look at all 24 hours. You need to be much more comfortable with randomness and figure out what to produce to get people to choose you on demand. That's a, a much higher burden for media companies. They have to become marketers in ways they never were before. Um, and the measurement had to change because we had to move away from giving people, you know, 
primetime ratings, 11 p.m. ratings, morning ratings, daytime ratings. We just had to give them 24 hours a day. Um, and that also means that video covers streaming apps like Netflix and Amazon Prime and YouTube, as well as networks. So that's a, a massive change in the way media actually produces its product. The, the second part of that is, of course, that completely changes the way you buy advertising as well, because yes. you're trying to fit into that, uh, you know, into that flow. Uh, the ad loads are coming down. Consumers have a limit to how much they're going to watch. That means the value is going up because you've got less chance to reach the consumer. You've got to be really right about it. Um, and you've got to define the audience much more than just the time slot. Uh, so that. Yeah, the change in measurement is just reflecting the fundamental change in behavior. The other thing I think that says for marketers, because brand scale always matters, you know, and you know, being able to reach uh, the maximum number of people is important for a large scale brand. Um, that's harder to do when they're not watching the same things at the same time. Uh, so that the one thing people are still watching at in large numbers at the same time is sports. Right. And so I, I think this also just increases the value of sports. Um, no matter how much you're spending on sports, you really have to understand them because they set the price for everything else. They do. Um, all of media live, and, and we see that umbrella getting bigger and taller and wider. Um, and, uh, you know, some brands did not believe they were sports brands and, and they may not be, but that doesn't mean they don't need to understand them because sports is actually in this new world uh, the 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 content that is setting the stage for everything else. And it's an audience building block, whether you like it or not. I mean, it's it, because it's the only remaining really big building block on a massive data set. Is that is that fair to say? I do think that's true. Right. There's, there, there's a few live award shows and. And, and breaking news draws people together, but it's not always the best environment. So, yeah, I, I think sports is the only thing you can count on as a foundation for any brand of scale. All right. Very good. So, so, um, so it's, it's not that measurement causes that creativity. In fact, I think it's hard to justify the investment without measuring. But I think you've got to get to the point you can measure asset building and not just, uh, you know, quarterly income statements. So, so, David, since the dawn of the Pleistocene era, and surely since I started at Proctor, um, everyone's been trying to measure the value of brands. No one's actually succeeded in that. Maybe the consumer goods companies have some kind of good measure for it. But everyone's been trying for years and years and years. How come there's not more progress on this? Um, because they don't get credit for it in the financial markets. Yeah, uh, unless unless they work hard on it. But I I'm more optimistic that listen, it, it is always, uh, you know, an, an estimate or a, or a predictive estimate of what's going to happen in the future. But there's a lot of services businesses that have gotten much smarter at net present value, lifetime value of a customer. Right. Getting to look at, at that um, and the role of brand in that. I think some of the car companies have gotten really smart on it. So I, I've seen more focus on brand and brand loyalty. And as they have called the number of brands they're supporting, they've gotten you know better about building the brands they have. So that that's making a difference. And, you know, I talked about media, which is just learning how to market, ironically, because they they used to just program to these cable schedules. Right. But now <laughs> they actually have to compete every minute of every day. And they're they're getting much smarter about how their platforms work, use cases, uh, discovery, all the things that add value to a consumer in the product that actually make it more loyal. So I I do think um, people are getting better at measuring brand value in terms of custom, customer loyalty, customer scale, um, and being able to count on those relationships as long as you keep nurturing them for, for years and decades to come. And there, I know there is a move towards NPS and retention becoming part of a lot of this. Any examples you want to give so our listeners can understand when you talk about the media companies rethinking how they do it? Can Anything you want to share? A good example? Yeah, yeah. well, I would say 
you know, Net- Netflix started on streaming first, and it's. I, I mean, th- those companies should speak for themselves, but but I think the you know what they've said publicly and what what I've seen up close is they really use data to make sure they're the first streaming app that they're positioned so people go there first, and that they're you know constantly tweaking the way they present their content um, in, on a very individualized basis so that people get suggestions of what to watch next. And I, I see that working really well. YouTube does it in a different way, um, but I think the way um, that they've really focused on their algorithms and autoplay to you know, keep teeing up the next video that people will find engaging has people watching an enormous amount of content. Most people are surprised that that over half of all YouTube content is actually viewed on a television screen. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really become television to so many people. And, and that, um, that started with a very different, you know, highly personalized approach, uh, using data, using AI to, to sort of tee it up. Um, and I think they also use that to make big decisions. They spend tens of billions of dollars with content creators. Um, and you've got to, Pick which ones are going to work and not work and you know providing the data to make those decisions has helped those content creators and helped youtube those same things are now coming back to sort of the the new platforms out of paramount plus or max from right. from warner discovery or or peacock out of nbc you know all of those uh and of course hulu right um, yeah. all of those streaming apps are are building these new skills um, following those who kind of went first. And so uh, it's just interesting to see how rapidly media marketing is evolving and how quickly they're changing their tools. Because they used to be building image using promotional spots on the on the linear right. television schedule. And now it's really changed in, in just a matter of a few years. This is this is super interesting. Why but and why we're on it. Let's talk about, you know, the standard commercial that was in place, you know, years and years ago, I think started by Procter on the daytime soaps. Um, is, is, is that, you know, and every, we just talked about everybody going to con is, is the, is the commercial headed for extinction? And, you know, you, you look at the Super Bowl where people are still pouring money into the Super Bowl ads. But then you see the decline of, in general, you know, the the regular commercial. Tell us what's going on there and what you think is going to happen. Well, um, I think you've just got more choices and more formats. Um, what, back to uh, customer behavior. Folks who are watching live events, <laughs> um, those can be programmed to create natural breaks, whether it be the Super Bowl or the Olympics or, or the World Series or you know, what we're doing right now in the, in the NBA finals. You can create natural breaks. You can have a, a reasonable unit. They kind of all have to be the same length, 15, 30 or 60 seconds, because you've got to fit in the break. It's got to work. So you know, that, that works for live events. In the entertainment part of media, which is, you know, a, a much bigger percentage of the time. Uh, when you're watching on demand, you've got more choices. You can right. you can have any length, right? You can have 12 seconds, 18 seconds. So you you can find different ways to tell the story. You can um, have interstitials. You can have things around the screen. So there's there's so much more opportunity to uh, to deliver a message in a natural way. Uh, when it's when it's streamed on demand, because you don't have to fit a standard, because everybody else is watching it on a different schedule, uh, in a in a different place. So I mean, we've seen this for years in the digital space, uh, you know, in the in the display world. But I, it's it's coming to video as well. I think it back to creativity. It increases the need to have truly you know great creative that. And, and great storytelling that the consumer loves because otherwise they can tune it up. They can move on. They, you know, <laughs> they've yeah. got lots of ways to avoid the ads as well. If you're not really adding value by, you know, telling them a great story in a, in a great format that appeals to them. I, I agree with this. Uh, like when we were at farmers or when I was at farmers, we had that jingle and we, we could get power out of that jingle in six seconds. Um, 
So, so well, you because what? you built yeah. an you, because you built because you built an asset. You, yes, that was you a super something. asset, impossible to measure on the balance sheet, but tremendously worth a lot of money. And I'm I'm hopeful that a lot of our listeners are humming the jingle right now. Um, hey, hey, so you've been you've interfaced with CMOs forever, or your whole career. Tell us about about the job and and how CMOs should be thinking about. Uh, and how boards should be thinking about getting the most out of their CMO, like CEOs and, and others, because it is still the fastest turning job in the C-suite. And I can't believe that's good for CMOs or companies. Um, no, and I and, and I think the challenge is, uh, and I see this in a lot of companies, it's it's viewed as the glue to, to cover a lot of other issues, right? <laughs> Great, great CMOs tend to live alongside great products and great services, and they they tend to live in strong financial companies that have balance sheets that can make multi-year investments, um, and they they tend to to work well with their tech partners um, on how to use data in a different way. So, you know, the environment of the CMO is key, and too many CMOs. You know, are are just charged with all that's working well. Leave it alone. Just go make sure you generate more leads. <laughs> you generate more opportunities. You generate more ways for us to sell, as opposed to CMOs who are really the voice of the customer, who deeply engage in is the product right? <laughs> is the data that we have about the customer actually reflect what they're doing? Um, are we doing things in a in a way that they trust and respect? Is it the right price? Uh, and and how does supply chain work in order to deliver that product in the in the right place at the right time? If when CMOs are engaged alongside the CEO on how it all works, they're very successful. But to think that you can live in the marketing silo in 2023 and get anything done, I think is uh, is naive. Um, and that's why it's easy to change them because they're not connected. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with this. I, I think what you just said is going to be music to most CMOs ears. Um, and I think part of this is how, how CMOs have to spec well, out the job. But then, but then, but then, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying, but then those CMOs have to speak up. They have to be aggressive. Well, and don't take the job if you don't have the seat. Um, because if you're if you don't have the seat where you can actually – bring the customer to the company and the other way you're going to get held accountable for it anyways but you're not going to have the the uh authority to change it and a seat at the table and and the other thing is i i think some companies should also be looking at the job spec to say is the authority to drive sales going with the responsibility or are we just hoping that we're going to put a nice brand campaign out there and change all these problems um I think that's a really big deal. Well, and, and I back to adjacent accountability. Um, so, you know, the, Jamie Modowski is the CMO at Nielsen. She, you know, was very successful before that at Amex Schwab and um, in Wells Fargo. But but now she also has HR, <laughs> right? Because um, so much of our brand is delivered through our people, and uh, and also back to the talent issue, it was our number one issue. We needed to make sure that our story worked internally and externally. And she also has customer success and is kind of the chief advocate for the customer by having the most frontline data on how products are used. And and I think that, um, you know, that's because she's a CMO who's also been a CEO. She, you know, she ran KitchenAid for a while. Yeah. And I, I, I look for CMOs who want to flex their general management skills, because I think that's really what you need. I think the classic, you know, CMO producing great commercials and and um, building the brand by putting them in a good media plan. Like, I, I think those days are done. Um, I agree with you. I agree with and you. And so they, the, the CMOs also have to have a seat, which is firmly at the center of the table for a marketing led company. So, any advice you have for CMOs when they get in front of a board? Because you've been on many boards. Like, give 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 our our, our folks out there some tips. Um, 
I think what's important is that the the CMO make the business case. I mean, bo- boards are accountable for increasing the value of the company. And I think most boards actually understand that that's the balance sheet, not just the income statement. And right. they, they want to understand what the asset is. But um, you've got to be able to tell that story. And you got to tell that story with, with numbers, not just words, <laughs> so that a board can get – and it, it it can be, you know, rough estimates, but but if a CMO works well with the CFO before they get into the room and can tell the story in a way that the boards can understand it and relate it to other investments that the company may be making and relate it to their mission of shareholder value, it tends to resonate and they tend to see the strategic value. I think the, the other thing that I have found really effective in, in some CMO presentations is they make sure to call on their colleagues during the discussion. So they connect it to supply chain, they connect it to uh, sales, they connect it to IT, they connect it to finance. Um, And the more a board sees that marketing is relied on and understood by the colleagues and peers of the CMO, the more you feel like it's central to the company as opposed to a cherry on top. Yeah, so I, I hear you saying, Make sure as a CMO, you're driving the business and the marketplace, not the marketing department, and bringing everybody into that is a is a really good way to do it. So, yeah, and you got and you've got to do that, you know, day to day. But you, day to day, specifically yeah. when you're in the boardroom, don't change that. You know, where I've seen it go wrong is when CMOs think, okay, the board wants to see, you know, the latest campaign. No, <laughs> they, and even if that's what they asked for. I think the more they understand, you know, how this is central to the way the company operates, the better. I, I agree with this. Thank you. Hey, so we're we're almost at time. So I'll give you a two part question. You could take one or both parts, but you have to take one. Okay. Uh, funniest marketing story you could share on the air, and or practical advice you would give our listeners that we haven't discussed yet. Um. Well, the, the the funny marketing stories. The the challenge is the marketers won't want me to share those on air. But the um, um, I, I I would say that that, is, that I, shouldn't stop you, in my opinion. But okay, I I hear you. But but <laughs> you were a client once, and you wouldn't want me to tell your stories, Mike. Oh, you could <laughs> if it was really funny. But I get it. Yeah. Um, but I do think on uh on practical advice. I, I just keep, I, I go back to where I started, which is around the talent. Um, the the only way you're going to be a great CMO in 24 and 25 and 26 is that you have recruited, developed, promoted a great team. Um, and the more your team is taking things off your plate, the more your team is building the skills you need. Uh, the better. And and that team can be people who are directly reporting to you, and they can also be kind of an expanded team of folks who are helping you from other functions. But uh, it's all about the people. And I, I think more and more every year, the, the more you understand marketing is a team sport and you're building that team, the more successful you're going to be. There's no other way to do it. Well, I think that is a great way to end the show, a piece of wise advice from a person that's been there, done that multiple times. So thank you, David. And thanks to everyone for listening to CMO Confidential. Look for more of our shows on Evergreen, Apple, Spotify, and YouTube, which include what venture capital really thinks about marketing. Is the CMO position headed for extinction? What I learned as New York City's first ever CMO under Michael Bloomberg And a CMO turned B-School professor offers her thoughts on how to fix the CMO position. Hey, all you marketers, be safe out there. This is Mike Linton signing off for CMO Confidential. Today's episode of CMO Confidential is brought to you by CMOcoaches.com. Are you a current or aspiring chief marketing officer looking to take your career to the next level? You should work with a CMO coach. CMO coaches are former CMOs who are nationally certified coaches. So whether you want to improve your leadership skills, develop your team, or drive better business results, we have the experience and expertise to help you succeed. 
To learn more, visit us at cmocoaches.com.